Ah, okay, we are we are live now. So we are starting our our third SIP meeting. Uh, I'm amazed to to have such important SIPs on the table to be discussed. Uh, we're going to start by the Scala Meta SIP. Uh, it's gonna it's going to be reviewed by Julian Dragos and Joshua. F. By the way, um, we have one uh, one new community member. Uh, Julian is joining the team. I think that given his background and his experience on the Scala compiler, he's a really good fit for for his position. For this position, and I'm really happy to have him on board. Uh, next to the Scala Meta SIP, we're going to have the SIP21 Sports, which is going to be reviewed by Martin. This is the first uh, the first um, review of uh, formal review of, of this SIP, and then we're going to go to SIP27, no SIP26, which is unsigned integers by by um, here our friend Sebastian, and. This this SIP is going to be also reviewed by Martin. He's going to to introduce the the new changes in the proposal, and then we're we're going to finish with SIP twenty seven, uh, which is trailing comments. Okay, so let's get started then. I think that Josh, uh, Josh and Julian, you guys could could just start giving some some idea of what the meta SIP is and. What, what it's bringing to the Scala community, how it's going to differ from the previous Scala macros to the new meta programming system. Uh, sure, uh, I can I can start if you want, Yuli. Um, Go ahead. So yeah, basically the, the inline and meta SIP splits macros into two pieces. One is a notion of inline, where you have an inline keyword that will take a method and inline it where it's called. Um, and you have inline arguments, and there's a whole set of rules, and it's basically a proposal on its own for how to do inline. Then there's a proposal for meta, and how meta fits in with inline, and uh, basically this would be a block of code which will run at compile time, and alter the syntax tree that you have, and turn it into a new syntax tree that then gets compiled. Um, and meta uses a library which is not the Scala compiler's AST. Um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Must be latency in the network, so I can hear myself. All right. Um, yeah. So I, the today, I think the thing we want to discuss is whether or not this becomes a SIP officially if it's given a number. Um, I unanimously think that we should give this a number. Um, there's a lot of things in it. Unanimously, me, a hundred percent. Just. Um, yeah, I think we should give it a number. Definitely, uh, it, it has a lot. There's there's a uh, a pending elegance in this SIP. Um, there's a few details that I'd like to work out with. Uh, we've had some discussion, Eugene and I. Um, I, I saw Julian had some more things as well um, that I'm adding on to. So I think we need to parse out some details. Um, but I I definitely support giving this a number. That's perfect. Thanks, Josh. So. I think that we should now uh, vote on on this giving a, giving it a number. So I think that guys, uh, we all agree on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Julian and Seth. Um, yeah, sure. Maybe um, maybe one. I don't know how is the usual um, what was the usual protocol in these meetings, but um, uh, since Josh mentioned this, I would also mention it. Um, the inline part of the uh, of the of this SIP. Seems to be orthogonal and actually independent of uh, of the macros proposal. So I wonder if it if it, it would make sense uh, to vote on them together or or separately. And I'm I'm fine with either. I just like to you know understand why they're proposed together. Well, they're not completely orthogonal. Uh, I mean, one, one it, builds on the other. Um, one well, builds. Yeah, sure. So first, definitely meta builds on inline. You cannot do meta. Alone without inline, inline could be its own thing, but it is very much designed to be integrated with meta as well. So I think it makes sense for these two to be discussed together. Uh -huh. Okay, so so then then uh, that's the part that's a bit unclear in the current proposal. On on what in what way does meta depend on inline to work? Is it just a marker on the method that makes? Meta somehow treat some things differently, or I, I I tend to agree with Julian actually to say well it's actually better to to split the two because then it's clearer what we discuss and I mean Scala inline and Meta is huge it's a huge proposal together whereas otherwise we would uh, have the 
advantage of being able to discuss the, the two separately. Uh, the, the other observation is that inline actually has an implementation, whereas meta doesn't have one yet. So uh, that's that also points to a different difference in speed. So we have an implementation for Dotty, right? Does that? Yeah. yeah. Sure, but um, I mean there is there is also the, the few small tricky corner cases and the interaction with an inline method whose body is a meta block. That we of course yeah. Uh, so I mean if we do manage to make them completely orthogonal, then it would make sense to separate them. But uh, that, that's actually going to be one of the things I'm going to push for in the slip. Is there there's a uh, Basically, it feels like inline and meta. You have a design for inline, you have a design for meta, and there's a competing design between the two. And so there's a workaround where, in the presence of meta, things are slightly different than they would be in vanilla inline. So um, I'm going to push for that to get removed if we keep them as separate concepts. I would like to see how far we can like keep the things orthogonal, um, if possible. Uh, but I think the focus here is, when it comes down to it, the middle part is the piece that I really want to see. Um, and detangling it makes it a little awkward, right? I think I think we're right that there's competing concerns. So I'm I'm not sure. I mean having implemented inline uh, and talked with uh, Eugene about it, it doesn't seem that there are competing concerns. I think one can very well split off inline and treat it as a separate thing. So my uh, personal opinion about this uh, whole matter is that meta indeed, uh, answering Julian's question, meta indeed depends on inline in the sense that, uh, well, current macros, uh, they combine two orthogonal concepts, one concept of inline and another concept of uh, doing compile time function execution. And uh, naturally, in order to reproduce uh, the current macro system or provide you know, a functional analog at least, we need both. And so just meta is not enough. And therefore, uh, as a result, yeah, my concern is if we split inline and meta into two separate proposals, and uh, if we uh, somehow accept inline before meta, then uh, there may be a situation when meta needs uh, some slight changes in the inline mechanism, while that uh, possibility will already be gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's my only concern here. But we could yeah. sort of make a make a note, take a note internally that. Essentially, meta must should be we won't decide on inline until meta is in a state where we, we know all the interactions. Well, right. unfortunately, that's not encoded in the process. So I don't know to which extent we could do this. Matter. We can we look at the we could indeed defer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Can can we look at the proposal? Is basically we had a proposal for macros at one point, and we have an experimental macro feature. And this proposal, if you view it as fragmenting that feature into two separate features, and it has to be one proposal, because we're taking an existing experimental feature and splitting it, right? That's what this proposal is. So we're splitting the original feature into two things, as opposed to two separate proposals, right? Because uh, today, if you wanted to do inlining, uh, there's two ways you can do it, but the most consistent way is to use macros. Um, and we don't want that to be the only way to do inlining effectively, right? Yeah, that right. makes sense. Right. I, I would like to understand a little better how thick the dependence of the uh, meta proposal on the inline proposal is. I, I, I certainly understand that there's a, a sort of thin syntactic dependence in, in that, you, you know, the, the magic sequence of keywords now to, d to define an old style macro as inline meta. But um, wh what is, uh, uh, how much more I I dependence is there on the, the details of how inline works? Well, as far as I understood, um, well, first, if you take meta alone and you have a method whose body is a meta uh, block, the meta block will only see the local context of the methods. Uh, if you look at the parameters, you only see the formal parameters. Whereas um, it, it kind of, so usually, I mean, typically you can't do much meta programming with that because you anyway only see whatever um, 
whatever you see at the formal definition, which anyway you would have known without metaprogramming to begin with. Um, so meta, in most cases, needs inline in the sense that you need your meta block to be inline at the call site to see the trees at the call site to be able to do what we typically do in, in the metaprogramming context. So that's one thing. Um, and the second thing is there is some subtle, unless it has been changed since the last time I read, there is some subtle change um, in where, when and whether actual parameters are evaluated if the main body of an inline method is a meta block. So if the main, the main body of an inline method is not a meta block, it's the trivial thing. You basically evaluate the arguments first, unless they're by name, of course, and then you use the some, you store them in local variables and you use the local variables instead of the formals when you inline. But if the main body is a meta block, then you don't necessarily do that, uh, if I understood correctly. And instead, you see the trees and you can avoid the, um, the, the eager evaluation of the parameters somehow, um, which, uh, which is some interaction there. Yeah, so is that, that correct? That, that's exactly as Sebastian okay. put it. So uh, meta needs inline to get access to trees of arguments to call the inline methods. And in the current macro system, based on scholar reflect, it happens automatically. And uh, here we need a feature interaction for this. This is so we can take like function literals and pass the whole tree down, right, to the macro. Well, for instance, yeah. Other types of things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that helps. Thanks. So I'm I'm not sure I got the other way around because I understood also inline has to look inside the meta that it's inlining, and if if there's a meta block in there, there's something else that it's going to do. So it's not going to be the, the plain. There's not there's two kinds of inlines. Is is that true? Well, actually, there's just one. Uh, so we, we can view inline as uh, something that uh, takes the right-hand side of a method definition and uh, just puts it into the call side. Okay. It's, uh, I mean, it, it remembers the original arguments for uh, for additional feature interaction with meta, but that's about it. So th th there are no two, uh, there are no different mechanisms. It's, it's it's only one mechanism, but it also accounts for the presence of meta. So inline is not completely independent of meta either. Okay, so there are dependencies in both directions. One is that inline needs, uh, sorry, meta needs inline so that it can see the uh, actual arguments that are passed to the to, to the to the meta, and then the other way around, inline has to be careful if the, if it inline the meta block to do something slightly different. No, I don't think that's true. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I don't think. Well, I well, Doki has a complete inline and then. I haven't. Uh, that there is no meta, and that there's no provision for meta, and I think it's it doesn't need one either. So it's well, it's just the fact that it's. I mean, the meta block needs to be evaluated after inline has been done. Right? Yes, I mean, that's right. And inside this meta block, we need to see the original arguments to the inline me uh, method to the inline call. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But you could argue that this is a requirement of meta alone that it is only expanded after all inlines. I mean, all outer inlines have been um, processed. The, the, so, it, so. Yeah, the issue, so the issue here is it's it's inconsistent. If you uh, so from a meta user, you would expect to get the arguments directly into meta, right? The way it's defined for meta inline, it makes sense that that's how you would implement it as like an optimization to make sure you don't implement the methods differently. It's just the expansion rules for inline and the expansion rules for inline meta have a slight tweak, and it feels like this specialized hook to make them fit well together. Uh, and I don't know if you can have one rule of expansion that just explains the whole thing away. That's the that's, that's the question, right? So uh, concerning the meta blocks, that's completely consistent with inline. You don't inline in inline methods either. So you wait until you do the outer inline. So and see, there's already precedence for that. And the other thing is the inline that gives enough info for meta to do its thing. So uh, I would argue that meta can be built strictly on inline, not the other way around. Of course, we have to design inline so that meta can do that. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, then actually it makes sense to have two different zips because I think there, there's a logical progression and inline should 
we, it sort of forces our hands to specify inline without reference to meta, which I think is a good thing. Okay. So if uh, we should probably vote for A to give to split them, and then B to give them numbers, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's so vote I'm, for the first one. Sorry, what did you say, Josh? Oh, I move to vote now. Okay. Let's. I second. So guys. Okay. So the first one. Um, split them. Well, first of all, do I get the vote? Well, as a matter of the set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I would propose to split these these proposals. Uh, are we are we gonna do it or not? So can we vote conditionally? Because I think it would yeah. be really important to link those two together so that uh, yeah. they are so that we either accept both or well we think what we do next. Yeah, I understand your concern. I think it's very reasonable. Okay, so so okay. let's say that one has to depend my, on the my other. My proposal one. is to have two different uh, numbers, but to uh, except inline only uh, when we know the fate of meta. So, yes. Yeah, yeah that's I perfect. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. That I sounds like that. a good compromise. Okay. Anyone else? Perfect. Josh? Yes. Yes. And Julian? Yeah? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So perfect, and then we we should decide on on well on the numbers. So they're go they're going to be numbered, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so what's the next number? Uh, twenty-eight, twenty-seven, twenty-nine. Yeah. So I guess in, in line should be twenty-eight, and meta should be twenty-nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm amazed to have two new sips of the. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Two instead of one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So I guess that this has been the first introduction to Scala Meta. We're going to continue the review in the in the next meeting um, because of time concerns. I think that if we have some time left, we can we can back, dig into 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 the meat of the proposal. But right now, I would like to jump to the sports uh, proposal, which which uh, Martin is going to to introduce. Yeah. So so the sports proposal has been around for a while. Um, uh, first introduction of the last update was September 16, 2013. Uh, 2013, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So um, the the essential thing of a spore is that we want to control in a closure what uh, what a closure can capture in its environment, and uh, the uh, idea there is that in a spore you have to. Uh, in the context of a spore, essentially the only references to the environment must be from uh, uh, local value. The only things that a closure can reference are local bindings in the enclosing block. So that's that means that gives you uh, uh, fine grained control over what uh, that spore is. Um, the uh, there, there are two parts. One is the spore. Um, I didn't quite get what it was a keyword or a uh, uh, predefined function spore open curlies uh, and then the block in the spore which contains the bindings and the closure. Uh, and the other one was then an implicit conversion uh, that essentially maps from a, a function type to a spore type and that essentially does the spore wrapper. Uh, I believe that actually one should. Um, change the, uh, the definition to put the implicit conversion first, because once you have that, you can score as a trivial definition. It's just essentially a thing that takes a score and that relies on the implicit conversion to provide, to provide the, 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 the checking of the block. Okay. Um, it seems to me that the whole thing can be done with a macro. And in which case it shouldn't be part of the language. Uh, that sort of uh, come back maybe to is Heather online now, or somebody with the support proposals? Um, um, well, there is one thing that doesn't really work uh, as the current proposal uh, uh -huh. says, is that so it relies on the implicit conversion from so a function type to the support type. That's right. Yeah. But this implicit conversion is not going to kick in anymore because yeah. now we have SAMs and the spore type oh. is a SAM. Ah. So uh, the compiler is going to just create a SAM for the lambda okay. and create it directly as a spore. And of course, we will not perform any check because there is no implicit conversion that creates course, the macro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So one way to uh, work around this <laughs> is, <laughs> is to dam. make it not a SAM. Yeah. <laughs> and this can be very easily achieved by adding some dummy abstract member <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, just in addition to the apply methods, yeah. another abstract method that just prevents it from being a SAM. Yeah. Um, so that's a technical detail I found while reading the, yeah. the, the SIP. Yeah. And also, to the best of my knowledge, the, the proposal hasn't been updated, but there have been some updates on the actual implementation and specification of SPORS. And for instance, there is a new type member called excluded that will basically prevent the appearance of a concrete type within within the, the function, within the HD yeah. that represents the function. Is that part of the SIP? It it's part of the SIP. It's not documented in the SIP. I mean, it has to be updated. I see. Is it still true that when you when you make a nested class that you get the inner class pointer from the outer class? Is that or is it only generated on demand, like when it's needed? I remember at one point, it, like these were being created when they weren't needed, uh, in like Scala two seven or something. There have there, been a lot of changes in that area. So, it, the, I mean, the answer is it depends. The, the compiler makes um, an effort to uh, leave out that outer pointer if it's not needed, but it, the, there's no simple summary of when that done or does or doesn't happen. Right. So, that, that's my concern with this. So, if it's not a language feature, that means that has to work consistently for the spore to be useful. Because if that outer pointer sneaks in, yeah. um, then you still can't serialize it, right? I agree. Yeah. So th there are two things here. You were talking about inner classes, but spores are mostly checking uh, lambda functions, so arrow arrow functions. Right, uh, but you turn that into a quite fundamentally different because inner classes, in most cases, they need the outer pointer, even if it's not completely obvious that it's going to be needed, because they can be subclassed, and uh, you have uh, things like that that happen. But for error functions, you can statically decide, in all cases, whether an outer pointer is needed or not. So yeah, if that, that's true, if that's true, then I'm like, then I'd agree. It doesn't need to be a slip at all. It just, you know, that that rule needs to be obvious and uh, consistent in the compiler. And then, it, then I totally agree. It's just a macro, right? But if if there's yeah. ever an issue where we end up with the the inner pointer sneaking into these things. It ruins the whole feature, right? It's true, but I, I think the right the right address for that is to, if we must make a SIP that specifies when an outer pointer is generated, I think for, for any function. For any exactly. Function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if there's any SIP, it would be about that as opposed to more general than for sports. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So 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 does a spore uh, change the way uh, the lambda is generated? Because I think uh, since those parameters, well, those local variables, local definitions in the outer scope um, uh, are there, probably the lambda will just get the pointer to, to the outer class and you know, navigate a path to get to them. Uh, so, so, sorry, Julian. Uh, we're going to welcome Heather, who has just done. Uh, we are actually discussing right now uh, sports. So uh, Heather is the author of sports, uh, the, the proposal. So yeah, feel okay. free to, to chime in. Heather, can you say something? We could not hear you. Uh, yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm perfect. Yep. So we were we were at the point where we discussed whether spores could be just a macro, and uh, uh, the general um, feeling was we think that that yes, that probably could be just a macro. In which case, they probably should not be as if um, that's um, in, uh, essentially done in the libraries. What's your take on that? Um, well, uh, so it's the sort of the same issue uh, as with the advisory board meeting, uh, if you remember that issue, which is uh, spores depend on pickling to be able to transitively determine whether or not the environment Oops. If you want to not use pickling, uh, spores don't help you very much. You don't get this transitive thing. So, um, assuming that you use pickling uh, with spores, then you get what you expect with spores. If you do not use pickling, um, the spores check is only skin deep. 
So, does that so make why, sense? Uh, no, because uh, you you cut out exactly when before you said transitive. So I don't know what is transitive. Transitive means um, that the environment, the entire environment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you were cut out again. For, okay, so that means the, the environment. Okay. Is it not working? It's working Try now, again. yeah. Keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it means that uh, I can also turn off the video, maybe that helps. Uh, so okay. it means that the. No. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there must be some conspiracy <laughs> there to prevent you from being able to tell exactly. <laughs> Yeah. No, so it doesn't actually work. A very good thing. Hello, guys. Yeah. Are we cut off for time? I guess this I is the problem this, on our this side. This time is <laughs> on our side. Oh. Well, I can hear you. I, yeah, and I can still hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. I'm still here as well. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Try one more time. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is an environment for a closure, and you know one has to make sure that everything that is reachable from sort of this the the first level of that environment is yeah. able to be serialized somehow. So the spores just kind of like make the the initializers of all of the things in the environment get called, but we. Okay, but now we got more. Yeah. So uh, the pickling, pickling kind of enables that transitivity. So, but you can't use spores with Java serialization and get the same, like you know, certainty about whether yeah. or not it's serializable. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But it strikes me that I think spores are not primarily about serialization. They're really about capturing. So that serialization demands another mechanism to be done properly. It's not surprising to me. I wonder. I think we probably shouldn't mix the two the two concerns in one. What do you think about that? Uh, I agree that spores should be more about capturing, um, but even so, it's still only skin deep. So only one level deep of, of being able to be sure about what you're capturing. If you're capturing something that's capturing something, uh, you know. Yeah. So, so right. I'm not saying that we need right. to change the compiler. I'm just saying that, um, that pickling does the transitivity bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a macro library, but I can't do any more than that first level of like transitivity with spores as a macro right now. Yeah, but I think that's. But that's shouldn't what that be? Um, I mean, sh shouldn't that be some some kind of uh, abstract type class that says uh, this is the kind of things I can capture, and the spore knows that that type class that says this is capturable somehow. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. if you want. In one particular case, you want something to be completely serializable. Then you instantiate that type class to whatever it, that to whatever it is that Pickling is providing. Uh, but if you want it for another reason, uh, then something else is providing it. Um, well, yeah, that, that type class is basically the spore, right? So there is an implicit conversion between a function and a spore. And if you are calling it inside. Any any part of the of your program, it's going to, need to be automatically converted. So what what it really means by skin deep is that you won't be able if if you're capturing a spore, a function and you are actually capturing that function, if it's not prevented by the spores implementation, you mm -hmm. could be capturing everything. So you need to yeah, especially hopefully. like see say that you are capturing a spore, and you need to explicitly yeah, sure. cast in the, in the in the definition side but of whatever you're capturing. Hopefully, the type of your function that you're capturing is actually then the spore type and not the function type. Yeah, that's right. So it's not specifically uh, depending on transitivity per se. You you can get transitivity via your types. I I didn't. I have to admit, I can't agree or disagree because uh, the internet dropped out for me again. Uh, so I missed much of what you said. Okay. So. Um, I'm not sure. Could you give me like a one sentence summary of the transitivity point that you're trying to make with abstract? Uh, that if you so if you capture a function, and you want that function also not to capture arbitrary things, 
Well, you can get that by the type of the function, because the function you're capturing would also have the type of support, not an arbitrary function. Oh, that's, well, no, I mean, only, on, that's only true if you don't allow uh, functions to be captured. So, uh, well, if you, if I can, I can allow a few immutable collections and, and then uh, a few immutable types and spores of myself, and it's a recursive type class derivation that doesn't need pickling per se. Mm. Yeah, but so you're, well, but it still doesn't. Right? I, I think this, these are sort of orthogonal concerns, whether we want something like that. And I, I really probably do want that. But I think it's actually good to keep the current the current spore proposal the way it is. It should be, say, flat, one level only. Keep it simple. And uh, my only thing is I am completely in agreement with everything that's there. I just, my only reaction is, well, this can and should be a macro. Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, how about this? I don't think it should be in the compiler necessarily, but I think that we've not really deeply considered the problem, especially given that like I wasn't really uh, able to kind of prepare like clear examples that would make this conversation a little bit more constructive. Um, I don't have a suggestion that it should be put into a compiler or not be a macro library. I just think that um, many many use cases where you assume that scores would do the right thing uh, right now as far as I can see uh, in the design as it is are, are limited basically and whether or not we want to try and support other means um, whether that be like I don't know some hooks in the compiler or something else I don't know uh, that could be a, a, a uh, another, another but uh, I, I think that the um, the design as they are it, they, they don't, they don't like alone. They don't offer a whole lot, actually. And if you want to keep them as is, fine. Keep them as a macro, but um, you know, it's it's not super useful as they are. So the question is, do we just abandon the notion of ever fixing this problem or making it somehow nicer, or do we just leave the proposal as it is, which is super limited and maybe not super useful? Um, do we want to invest more effort into trying to make it more useful and what do we need in order to make it more useful? Mm -hmm. um, this is this is uh, this is kind of you know where I think maybe we should try to invest a little bit more thought. And I could happily prepare uh, some argumentation for the case where we want to go down further down the rabbit hole to make this actually you know spores be able to guarantee more what you know we expect them to guarantee rather than being a super skin deep thing mm. but you know if it's if we're talking here and i think in this subcommittee we're talking about the language extensions then that's i believe precisely not the point that we want to address here so language extension i think it needs to be something super simple super well understood on which we can vote right now if you say the spore proposal as is is actually not sufficient and we need more research and more development to do something better then uh, I think that's also great and we should do it, but it's not our task in the SIP process to vote on this right now. It just means, well, more research is needed, so I guess we should, we should, we should close this one right now and, and have it come back if, uh, if we're not, if you have a proposal that a proposer feels is now ready to be reviewed. Well, well, we could look at it like this. You could give it another iteration and give me time to produce that uh, argumentation and these examples uh, for you, or you could close it and we could just not consider it again. Um, these are the two valid approaches for, uh, I think, handling this and making a decision on it. That's right. No, no, I mean, if you, if you say, look, I'm, I want to do another iteration on this, or you or uh, maybe to, together with some people, some other people, then uh, yeah, sure. I mean, let's give it another iteration. Uh, I agree. All right, um, if that's the case, um, if we do want to give it another iteration, uh, I let you guys decide since it's not for me to decide, but for me, if we do an iteration uh, two plus, like not next month, but one month after would be would be better for me. Sure, yeah, okay. two months. So okay. we're, we're well, three months, maybe. Three months, seems like. Would that, would that, uh, would that be reasonable for you, Heather? Three? Um, okay, sure, I guess. But wait, that's this, this November 20th, or? My, my, my no. only concern is that I, I, really think, I really think this is a great proposal and what I I would 
I would like to see is that the effort is spent on actually getting this stuff that, that what, what's described here or some variation of what's described here into into the library or into something that people can actually consume that is that is fixed and uh, and uh, maybe into a platform or something like that. So, um, uh, but I think, if you, I think, I think that's not a problem. I think that's like okay. we can we can definitely go that route. I'm just I'm just thinking that maybe there's a way to make them. Uh, meet expectations more of users and I'm not totally I'm not sure yet that just a macro library is going to get us all of the way there and mm -hmm. so this discussion of maybe if there's a hook or something that needs to exist um, you know we could have that discussion once I determine you know what what that might require but yeah yeah. yeah. If if the if the goal is to get this in the hands of users before we made too many decisions about it, I think that probably not too many would people would use it unless the connection with serialization is implemented. Right. Yeah. Um, that that I, th I think that that's the that's what would drive the most users to it. Yeah. Right. right. And I mean, not be, not you know, basically being able to choose their serialization mechanism and not be tied to pickling is is I think rather important but I mean it should not be the focus in order for these in order for spores to hook up to ser to a, a proper serialization mechanism you need this transitivity thing yeah um, and also a minor a minor point uh, right now spores are using is using right now white box macro so at some point we should figure out how to how to handle this because as far as I know mm -hmm. the meta SIP is now rejecting my well is basically it doesn't um, keep white markers in the in the scope. So they are probably going to be deprecated, or I don't know what your take on this is, Eugene. So we should probably, if this is going to be on the library side, we yeah. should probably set out, set out a plan. Can, can, uh, uh, yeah, it's a white box marker, marker, because wow. at some point you are defining structural types, refine, refinement types for the left-hand side. Only for the excluded, which is not part the of this. And the type captured as well. Yeah, but neither is part of this proposal. Cap capture is not no, part, of part of the proposal. Well, it, it uses picklers, right? Picklers are white box macros as well. That's right. But um, neither are picklers part of the proposal. Yeah, but the spores is independent of picklers. Spores is independent. Okay. All right. For the for the for the pure pa capturing thing, you don't need a white box macro, as I've understood. I'm happy to be corrected, but that was my reading of the thing. So, so I guess uh, we need an update of the proposal, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's I actually haven't. Uh, I need to to go to revisit it. It's, I think uh, I think it's outdated, honestly. Okay, excellent. Okay, and then uh, yeah. by the time we discuss this uh, in two or three months, uh, we'll also have uh, more updates about the white box macros uh, business. Mm -hmm. Because in the proposal, uh, actually entertain a few possibilities how to integrate mm -hmm. some white boxes in, into the uh, new macro system. Mm -hmm. We've received uh, very very good feedback and. Well, let's just uh, wait a little bit before making a decision here. Okay. Perfect. That's a very good decision. Thanks, Eugene. Good. OK, so um, yeah, let's say two months for this. Are you OK with that, Heather? Yep, fine for me. Great. So let's move on right now to SIP26 and signed integers. Uh, Sebastian has been doing some work on it. Uh, he's basically working on the implementation. And he's been doing some benchmarking. So I would let him introduce his his updates on the proposal? Well, so the, the news are pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to get to the meat of it immediately. So one, one main concern uh, was that um, the implementation of cooperative equality would uh, incur some performance hits on boxes runtime.equals, which is the thing that implements the equal equal operator of Scala. And um, I was uh, convinced that I could improve boxes runtime so that uh, this, this performance hit would not happen. Uh, and I tried very hard, and I failed miserably. So uh, basically, the closest I got was um, with um, uh, was was basically a six-person performance hit on a hash map uh, benchmark. 
uh, using uh, case classes. So if you use maps of ins or longs or any numbers, it doesn't have any performance hits. But if you use a map of, uh, of non-numbers, then that code path is a bit longer and has some hits. Of those six persons, three persons come from the hash codes implementation, so the hash hash thing, which, and that code path can be removed if we change uh, unsigned byte and unsigned short to actually be uh, backed by an int or car instead of a byte and a short. For obvious, uh, well, not non-obvious, very obscure details of how hash code are specified <laughs> and implemented. Um, uh, anyway. And the other three persons are really coming from uh, equal, equal. And those um, apparently cannot be fixed without patching the, the superclass of unsigned integers so that it extends Java long number. So the obvious question is, why not making them extend Java long number in the source code? Well, because there are any valves, and any valves can only extend objects. So uh, we would need to change something in the back end that say, oh, this is one of those four weird classes. Uh, I'm going to patch the parent class. And um, so I think that was not a good idea uh, to embark on. That would make them even more compiler specific. And then it would be even more like these are really primitive kind of thing. But at the same time, they're not, uh, because the arrays of those things are boxed, and uh, specialization doesn't work. And uh, so there was the, I mean, the conflict between saying those things are primitive uh, in the sense that they are overhead free, and, um, and at the same time saying, no, they're not completely primitive. We can implement them as, as any valves. I mean, there, we, we end up being somewhere in the middle where they're neither user land nor primitive. And there's some weird thing that doesn't really uh, make sense. So I decided to um, basically drop this effort. Uh, I don't think it's, it's going anywhere that is elegant and, uh, and performant at the same time on the JVM. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my report. <laughs> OK, so I guess that the only possibility here for us as committee members is to reject the SIP, because there is I no author. And this is the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like uh, there are technical problems that cannot be solved in an easy way. So yeah. Any take on this, guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah, if the champion disappears, I think we have to kill the SIP. Oh. <laughs> All the technical difficulties, right? Implement a new JVM. Yeah, exactly. That would probably it, it, be easier, it, It's right? called V8. <laughs> you can open a JSR. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so by the way, Sebastian, uh, I've been just wondering, so you're saying that some changes in the back end may actually fix the uh, last 3% of performance hit, right? On equals, yes. OK. Not yet on arrays and so specialization. Is that, I mean, uh, is that specific to the JVM back end, or? Uh, it, uh, um, ha. Uh, yes and no. I mean, in, in JavaScript, uh, we would, I mean, so, so the, the, my take on this is if it is indeed completely rejected at the JVM uh, level, mm -hmm. uh, the unsigned integers will reappear as js.uint because we really need them for interoperability with JavaScript. They just won't be platform independent, which is a okay. se separate thing. And, but I mean, that's fine. Uh, we, I mean, we have other JavaScript specific types like js.object and js.array and others. So we'll just have js.uint. Um, and uh, the, I mean, these need special treatment in the JavaScript compiler, but that was all, I mean, that would have been the case anyway. Uh, How do you see uh, the, the situation with Scala Native in, in, that, uh, in, that, in the light of that? Well, I think Scala Native right now already has its own unsigned integers. 
because it is even more critical for them uh, for it's basic interrupt with basic C functions. So they couldn't wait anyway, so they, they already have something. And uh, well, they will be separate. So um, Scala.js has its JS and sanitizers. Scala Native has its uh, C and sanitizers. And JVM doesn't have any sanitizers. And these are three separate things that are platform dependent. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm foreseeing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of code duplication that uh, occurs here? Well, I guess, uh, yes. Because you, you and Dennis will have to implement the um, logic, but the yeah, on your own. The types, the definition of the types, but mm -hmm. the implementation is, is really different. Um, ah, OK. Yeah. I I don't think that, I mean, yes, you have the, the, the definition of the data type, which is called uint, and has a, a whole series of methods, but the implementation of those methods is backend specific anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. So, guys, we have to back uh, fast track to save 27. Let's vote on this. Um, so, starting from you, uh, I guess, Sebastian. Um, voting to reject this. <laughs> okay. Who is in favor? Okay, Julian. Voting to reject it as well. Perfect. Heather? So so one thing I noted. Sorry, in favor. <laughs> in favor, OK. Uh, okay. Eugene? Oh, Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. So we rejected the, the, the proposal by majority. Um, so let's, you were saying, um, I, I found this really hard to find because it's not in our list of SIPs, actually. Yeah. It should be because if you Google for it, it's impossible to find SIPs. Yeah, six. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will update it. With the and other ones, we should yeah. update the, SIP, the list of pending SIPs to make it current. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> so let's move to. It's really easy. It's just a little file on, on, on the scala.github.com GitHub repo, uh, the list of SIPs. So you can just like just throw in the links there, and it should be. And I, I keep having the same problem. I keep going to that that page to find the the, the document. Yeah, right. Yeah, I will do that. Thanks. So let's move to SIP twenty seven training commas. Uh, so I invited Dale to join the committee to discuss this uh, more quickly uh, when we were at the Scala World, and today Dale is here as a guest. I, I think he's going to help us to discuss the, the SIP 27 and get to, to a point where we can either decide on, on approving it or giving uh, giving it another iteration or plainly rejecting it. So, uh, Dave, do you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Perfect. So I would like to, well, Gene, is your turn. Um, so Gene is going to introduce the, the new updates from the SIP 27, and let's see what happens. Hi, Dale. Uh, so Dale, a few weeks ago, he provided the new updates to the SIP. And since uh, the original idea of adding, adding trading commas everywhere, it uh, kind of met some resistance. So uh, there were concerns that uh, that will complicate the language, uh, among others. Uh, I won't go through that uh, at the moment. So the idea that Dale had uh, was to allow trading commas only for multi-line comma-separated elements. Uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot uh, share my screen. Or can I? Let's see. Maybe that will be possible. Screen share. Whoa. Hang on, guys. Can you see my screen now? Yes, but it's small. You should need to click on it. Yep. Yeah. OK, so uh, here's the example. Uh, that, uh, that I was referring to. So what Dell suggests is that we allow the first snippet of code, uh, where we separate uh, elements in the parameter list of the class uh, by commas. But we do not allow for any commas if there are no new lines. So that uh, seems to be a compromise between the original idea and uh, the feedback from the community. And what uh, personally I find really interesting about this is that it solves uh, the you know the very fundamental problem that a lot of people seem to be this improves upon, namely editing of uh, SBT configuration files. 
And uh, so that's, uh, I guess, the main question that Dell has to the committee today. And the other questions, uh, I'll just uh, scroll down a little bit. So what do we do about trading commas in a lot of other syntactic positions? But that's all like derivative from the first one. Um, I guess uh, this is it on my side, and uh, I would like to ask for your input, guys. What do you think about this change to the proposal? It looks very good. I like the fact that it's um, it's it's similar in a way to uh, semicolons uh, that we we allowed the insertion of semicolons in place where we have new lines, and here we're sort of allowing to remove commas uh, where there is a new line. Uh, and it does, it, it really does, it does address, I mean, all the places where I would want to put the trailing comma are the places where I would write them multi-line. If I'm not writing them multi-line, I really don't want to put this trailing comma, uh, which, is, which does not improve any kind of thing. And uh, conversely, it's also where there is there is less room for for error. Uh, if if I am missing some additional parameter in a in in a list which is multi lines, kind of obvious. Uh, whereas on a single line, it's not completely obvious. I mean, th these are things that other people have said on the on the SIP, but I, I really agree with those things. So um, it it. So interesting as a trade-off because it improves the thing that needs improving and it doesn't worsen the thing that should not be worsened. Mm. But it, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure at all about it. <laughs> uh, I just like it matches with, uh, with sort of it, it throws out another another equivalence in the language which says well essentially the, whether you write a, a new line or not in front of a parent doesn't matter. So. No, it suddenly does. Um, it's true that you say, well, we, we went that path already with, with semicolons, but that's, I mean, if you look in detail, the rules for semicolons are completely different. And it, if you would want to make an analogy, then the analogy would be that you can leave out commas altogether, which you can for semicolons, right? Sure. Um, so, so I, I think it just messes with, uh, with another aspect of the language and, uh, for me, the trade-off is that, as you know, I don't find this thing really important. I find it completely unimportant. So I don't think, I don't really think we should be prepared to to sort of uh, throw overboard any of the sort of fundamental principle of language design to make this to improve the usability of this thing a little bit. Uh, but uh, other people have different trade-offs. They might find this more important than I do. I, if you say that the, the, the tricky bit is SPP configuration files, well, SPP has already a non scalar mode, so let them just continue with that and throw it out in SPP. I'm not sure SPG is the main motivation. I guess it looks like it because, well, they all, the author is an SBT guy, <laughs> and so the examples are SBT based. Uh -huh. uh, but I have a lot of other places in my code base that just use configuration objects, I mean, internal to my APIs, and I have lists of things. Isn't, isn't this a thing that the IDE can remove automatically for you? I mean, do we need to put that in the language? I mean, that, that seems to be sort of this sort of trivial formatting thing that you can throw over <laughs> the site to an IDE and be done with it. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I'm I'm totally on the fence about this one, and I I kind of am beginning to like see the whole IDE argument a little bit more favorably recently. Um, but then again, I am a person who doesn't use an IDE, so so the and and this issue is not enough to get me to use one. So um, I, I feel very much still on the fence about this about this. Uh, proposal. I don't know if Dale, do you want to interject at all about the whole IDE argument? Uh, do you have a good reason against putting this in the IDE and keeping it in the language that you could rehash for us? Uh, yeah. So um, the IDE, the, the saying that this problem is an editing problem is is correct. Um, but the question is that uh, what a lot of the things that Scala does over Java is it makes it easier 
<clears throat> to author and, and sort of code in Scala. Um, and uh, so the compiler can do a lot for you that you don't have to do by hand or your tools don't have to do for you, such as you know, type inference, as an example. Uh, so I see it in that light, as in uh, rather than fix each and every editor and ID and so forth for all these features, let's just fix it in the compiler. That's my thought. I mean, it's a valid, valid argument. Um, I don't know, Yuli, Seth, do you guys have? I, I would definitely use this. Um, but I, I sort of dislike the distinction between multi-line argument lists and uh, single-line ones. So I think if, um, if this is going to go forward with uh, special treatment of multi-line arguments, I will not be in favor of it. I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what is the disadvantage of allowing it uh, everywhere. I mean, unless you have, I mean, you, you'd get, probably if you forget an argument, you'd get a type error as well, unless you use repeated parameters, maybe. That's the only case where you wouldn't get the error. Um, but uh, I agree with, with Martin, it's not a super important uh, issue. And actually, Scala had this a while ago, and then it was removed. And so, um, yeah, to make it short, um, I think it can it can help people, especially for uh, large configuration objects, and, and I see more and more of those uh, in in the Spark world, sort of. So um, I, I can see its usefulness, but uh, I wouldn't like to special case this just for multi-line argument lists. Um, I, I'm kind of on the fence of, about this as well. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, I lean against it, but it's not strongly against. Um, and it's really just the just the, an art, the my basic argument is uh, about overall size of the language. Um, I, I just don't th think that the the problem it addresses is uh, is large enough to warrant um, adding adding more stuff. I mean that's that's what it boils down to for me. You know, it's, I say so sorrowfully because the problem is real, and because also because Dale has, has done such a uh, really stellar job of of uh, presenting and and justifying this. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I would like to to thank Dale for all his his work on this. So, given given the fact that we don't really have feedback to give uh, him to improve on on his uh, his proposal, and that we have. Uh, now we have technical and uh, concrete opinions on either this should be accepted or not. I would propose to vote on this right now and try to to shed some light on on its future. <laughs> so it looks like for half the people, it will be throwing a coin and see whether it has to tail at this point. So is the vote really meaningful? I don't know. Maybe it is. Well, even if it's not meaningful, we still have to vote on this. We cannot give it another uh, iteration because there is no it makes no sense basically. Dale, we, we don't make we don't want to make Dale work more on this uh, than necessary, and it looks like the committee has its own view right now of what or whether this should be accepted or not. So I would be inclined to vote right now and propose to all the committee members to to have a say on it. <laughs> OK, I can go first. Um, I'm voting in favor if it's not the special casing version. OK. Right, so we're going to vote for three versions. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, the first one is without special casing. The second one is special casing. And the third one is rejecting uh, training comments. Negative. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. No worries. Um, yeah, but the problem with three-way votes is that they don't work, mathematically speaking. So, so can maybe... I vote for Martin, by the way? Yeah, Martin said that he is voting. Uh, no. Can, can we take like a little informal three-way poll and then decide how to vote formally based on that? Uh, yeah, maybe that's a good good idea. Maybe you know. Maybe we decide first. And then, uh, and then we will. Yeah, 
because I mean, if we, <laughs> if we do something right now without having uh, without having the protocol for that, well, yeah, it may be weird. Just, just wanted to know this. We could also just vote for or against, and then yeah. you know come to a consensus. If we if in if if it wins, if it's like we vote yes, uh, then we can do a second round vote of should we or should we not special case. That seems yeah. more. I think better. Yeah, the only problem I see here is that Julian wouldn't accept training commas if they are special cases. True. So, but anyway, let's go this way because it's simple. Uh, Julian, you can you can <laughs> the other and the other uh, iteration if you want. So let's go for yes or no. So, Sebastian. So I vote in favor of the proposal. Okay, so we have two favor, and we have one. Uh, Wait, again. well, you should. Ask Julian what. Really, yeah. I'm still in favor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then we have Martin that said no to this proposal. Uh, I've, well, I voted as well. The very fact that he said no, uh, I think that that means that he betos the 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 actual proposal. He so he can vote yes or no, but if he feels really strongly, he can veto stuff. Like we can let's take the veto also in the next step. Make consensus first, and then see if he vetoes. Okay, but I sure. I vote in favor. So Seth is no, I'm yes. Eugene, I think it makes sense, uh, but only for the new one or for the last one. Okay, so you're also yes. You can't be so conditional. We, we have four yes, no three yes, and two no's. Four yes, I vote yes. I, oh, you vote yes. You vote yes. Okay. Four yes. Four yes. yes. Two no's. Uh, Has everyone voted? Okay, yeah, everyone's voted, yeah. Okay. So, next step is special case or not special case. Yeah. So, those who voted yes, Eugene, special case or not special case? Oh, as I said, special case, yes, that's right. Um, I'm actually torn on this one, but I will vote for the special case. Uh, mostly because it seems like it had better acceptance in the community feedback. I I'm also uh, in agreement with Sebastian, only because it seems like people are you know less worked up about the special case version. I, I prefer the special case version as well. Yuli, yeah, <laughs> you know my vote, but I really think. Yeah. The special casing does complicate the language way, way more than the other one. But I, I, I'm in mean, mi minority. I agree with you, but I guess it's like the, so. So the reason. So I, I actually ch changed my vote. I was originally going to go with the not special case, um, but uh, basically the reason why I changed was because usually special casing causes lots of anger in the community because something doesn't behave as they expect it to. Yet in this case, the community was like. More, more in favor of, of the special case. Right. Right. So maybe it turns out that you know more people will be angry in the end, but preliminary evidence yeah. seems to indicate that they seem to prefer the special case. Right. Well, I mean, you might have a formatter that doesn't know. I mean, you, you do have formatting rules that say if the argument list is less than three arguments, then make it on one. So you might end up with the trailing comma after formatting automatically and having parse errors. but. That's also true. Anyhow, so we have we have a vote. I guess now we have to know if Martin vetoes or not. Yeah, yeah. so let's see if he vetoes and then um, get yeah, you just you just messed me up again on the special casing argument with the tool the tool point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think well, basically the tool wouldn't work. Like the, I mean The first like, and foremost goal of a formatter is not to break the ASD, right? So yeah. I would consider it a bug of the of the formatter if it does that. Sure, sure. Okay, but I think this, I think that the formatter could probably be adapted to the annoying the annoying special case, but the annoying special case helping average people more than the helping two authors, I think. Right. So we have four special case and one known. Oh, I'm so on the fence about uh, this one. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We would change to three to two. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, is it three? Oh, yeah, you're yeah, right. I contested you, okay, you both as yes for the special case. Yeah, but, it, are we, but no, we're, we're not. It's two and two, isn't it? It's either three and one or two and two. 
No, we're five no. people. Right now, no, if you say yes, yes, it's four to one. Yeah, sorry. Okay, all right, fine. Then I guess we're going to the special case version. I, I misunderstood the count. Right, so we're um, going to the the next step. Case. Next step is probably to, uh, you know, inform Martin of the committee decision and give him the right to veto since he has that right. But uh, otherwise, I think, I think we can uh, say that it was approved by the committee for now. Yeah, right. Uh, it was approved by the committee, and we will have some some news uh, soon about about if either it's finally approved or rejected by Martin. Well, uh, I would like to to end this uh, this meeting. It's been very fruitful, and thanks uh, a lot for all the watchers, uh, all the people watching the the video. So I hope that well, we we we'll see each other next month, and we'll have more proposals to discuss. <laughs> thanks, and thanks, Dale, also. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you all. See you. Bye bye.